are many, many translations of the Bible. One of the age-old favorites is the King James. But as we look at the translations over the years, they have all been able to make it in a language that we could better understand it. But the passages in each one of them that deal with the salvation of man, there's no, no difficulty in understanding that the grace of God is free to all of us. Looking at Romans 6, 1 through 4, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead in sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead, we also should walk in the newness of life. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you've bestowed upon us. And Father, we are thankful for the freeness of your grace. For those that have committed terrible sins or those that have committed none at all on this earth. But in thy sight, we're all guilty. For you've said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the easiness and the simplicity of your salvation, that it is free unto us, regardless of who we are or what we have done. For it's in your name we do pray. Amen. Go ahead and be turning in your Bibles to Romans chapter 6, if you've not done so already. Romans chapter 6. Let me just uh, again say, uh, with each time that uh, I have an opportunity to fill this pulpit, uh, it's always a great privilege, it's always a humbling uh, thing for me, and I always miss our pastor when he's gone, we spoke yesterday, and uh, he said, you know, he called me, of course, as a good pastor, uh, he called me before I could call him and say, hey, pray for you while you're gone, he called me and said uh, he'd be praying for me and for us this morning, and uh, I miss him, I miss him when he's not here. And uh, he has some great people to fill in for him, but uh, I always love it when Brother Jeff is here uh, to bring the word because he's so faithful to it and he explains it so well. How many times have we gone to a passage of scripture and we've, where we've either never heard a sermon from it or we've never maybe understood it and he explained it and read it and taught it to us in such a way where something that was so complicated and convoluted perhaps to us becomes so clear. I thank you, Brother John, for your words there on the God's free gift of salvation and how it's clear. Isn't it uh, amazing? We have many discussions about which translations are best. And God has given us so many wonderful translations. And what is clear is that God makes himself clear to us through his word uh, in the Bible here. Well, uh, what I want to do is we're going to go to the end of Romans chapter 5 just a little bit. And then into chapter 6 a little bit beyond where we just read. Um, but I want to talk to you this morning about wrong conclusions. Wrong conclusions. Uh, relate a story to you. Many years ago when Aaron and I were dating, uh, we went somewhere, maybe in Subway, but it was some sort of a restaurant where you get your meal and you get a cookie. I don't always get dessert, but that day I got a cookie with mine, she got a cookie with hers. And we're sitting there eating, we enjoy our meal and get to the end and I'm sure I was eating faster than her and got to my cookie and devoured it and thought, man, that is a delicious chocolate chip cookie. And then I'm watching Aaron and, I, and something happened. She ate hers, she nibbled around or pulled off just a little bit around the edges and left that big chocolate chunk or two in the center of the cookie and left it sitting on the edge of her plate. And I don't know how long she paused. I'm going to say it was a long time, but maybe she even went up and went to the restroom or got a refill on her drink or something. But I looked at her plate and I drew this conclusion. I said, she left the best part. <laughs> she must not want it. And so I enjoyed the center of that cookie with the best part, the chocolate chunks right there in the middle. And I, I just couldn't for the life of me figure out why would she do that. So she comes back and I'm smiling and she looks with a puzzled look. And 
of course, as you guys know, because you're chuckling, she was saving that, wasn't she? She wanted that. So sometimes we draw wrong conclusions. Well, yeah, it, it worked. I, I work in pest control, and I'll, I'll get to that at different points throughout the sermon. That's sort of the life I'm coming to you from uh, right now. But uh, in pest control, uh, we had this big project that we were working on, and it involved uh, some getting some equipment to handle this particular job. We were a large facility where they produced pharmaceuticals, and they had uh, a building that was, I don't know, about 100 feet high, and we needed a particular piece of equipment to reach up to, to address some things that we we're doing on this, on this particular building. So we build up this whole proposal, and we go to them and say, we can solve your problem with you know, X problem with X solution, and uh, we present a price to them, and they say, oh, yours is much cheaper than the competitor. We'll go with you guys. And we think, well, you know, we did the best we could. hope there's no egg on our face. So we get out there and we begin addressing the needs, right? Everything that we thought we had concluded that we needed to do this job correctly. And we get to a certain point, we realize that what we proposed to them was based on a wrong conclusion. It was based on a wrong estimate of what we thought we could do. Now, there were some other mitigating factors where they wouldn't allow us to get in certain distances. But in this instance, this wrong conclusion cost several thousand dollars difference. Sometimes we make the wrong conclusions, don't we? Like what we see the Apostle Paul doing here in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, he does it multiple times, is he's addressing some wrong conclusions. So read with me again, chapter 6, verse 1. He says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in grace, or continue in sin, that grace may abound? He says, by no means. So here, the hook is, Paul's referring back to what happened previously in chapter 5, what Dalton read for us just a, a moment ago. So look back at chapter 5 with me, and let's pick up uh, in verse uh, 15. He says, But the free gift is not like the trespass. Here in this passage, pause for just a second, here in this passage, the Apostle Paul is going to compare Adam and his trespass, or Adam and his sin, against, or contrast that with, Jesus and his work of righteousness. That is, Jesus taking our place on the cross, dying for us, living a perfect and sinless life, perfectly fulfilling all the righteous requirements of the law on our behalf. And Paul is contrasting the devastating effects of what Adam did in bringing sin into the world versus what Jesus has done through his, what he calls, one act or one singular act of righteousness. That's the complete work of Christ in fulfilling the law. He's going to contrast these two things and then we're going to see the conclusions as we get into chapter 6. So he says, picking up again in chapter 5, verse 15, But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift, following many trespasses, brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Pause right there. You see the contrast now. You see the different language as Paul describes what the devastating effects of Adam's sin and how it reigns over us. Sin reigns over everyone in the world. We're all guilty of Adam's sin. We participate both uh, in, in a federal headship way in the sense that we too are guilty because he made that choice for us. We bear that guilt. And then also, practically speaking, we bear that guilt because we are sinners in our practice. We act out on our sin from a very young age. So Paul's contrasting that, right, against what Jesus has done. For if, because of one man's trespass, 5 verse 17, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. 
Now don't get confused with the, with the all and the many here. Paul's point isn't about these are elect, these are non-elect. That's not Paul's discussion here. He does get into that in chapter 9. But let's not get hung up on any of that kind of stuff and start wandering off with our minds here. Paul is making a direct comparison here. So it says in verse 19, For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's a lot going on in that passage. I want you to focus in though on verse 20. He says, now the law came in to increase the trespass. The way we are to understand this is, God gave us the law that we might then see the sin that is in our life, right? As a mirror, as a measuring stick, or as a bright light shining into our hearts. We see where we are, are, are sinful, right? So it increases in that sense. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So God gives us the law. We, we become aware of the fact that we're sinners. But he says, the more we're aware of the depths of our own sin, the more we realize that God's grace through the work of Jesus Christ abounds to cover even that sin and the next sin and the next sin and the other sins that we've got yet to see or reveal in our, in our lives and in our hearts. So here's the wrong conclusion that we draw today. The wrong conclusion, verse, chapter 6, verse 1, well, what should we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? In other words, our thinking goes this way. So you're telling me, God, that the more I realize sin in my life, the more grace I get? So the more I see sin and sinful acts in my life, the more I realize how much grace you've given to me, then I'll run headlong into more sin. I'll continue in this sin. Because your grace is abounding and abounding and abounding to me. Or we say, maybe more secretly, and perhaps this is a better description of us here in this body, is we say, I know I shouldn't go there, or do that, or think that, or look at that, or say that, or participate in that. God's grace abounds to me. Almost a shrug, isn't it? God's grace abounds all the more. Right? Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, May it never be. Paul's response to that question there. In chapter 6, verse 1, he says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? By no means. No way. God forbid. May it never be. That's the wrong conclusion. It's the wrong conclusion. So what I want to do this morning is I want to look at the what, the why, and the how of living under grace. That's what Paul's addressing here. This book of Romans is amazing. We shared a laugh a little while ago because I, I know that Brother Jeff went through Romans for uh, a couple of years, I think. And that was before we started attending here, uh, worshiping with you guys and joined this family. But uh, I, I, I'm sure I can't touch how great his messages were on this, but uh, the book of Romans is so rich and full. And I just want to explore just a moment this morning with you the what, the why, and the how of living under grace. Okay? So, first we see in chapter 1 verses, or chapter 6 verses 1 through 3, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin, to sin still live in it? He asked that question. Verse 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. All right, so here we need to see the what of living under grace, right? So if Paul says we are not to continue in sin, then that implies for the believer that sin is still a reality for us. Sin is still a reality for us. I remember being in college, and I was at a Baptist college and Bible college, and we were studying for ministry, and and things like that. We talked to this pastor. This was in Dothan, Alabama. I had a friend struggling with sin, with some areas in his life, struggling, struggling. And he went to this pastor, and he asked this pastor, he said, 
I'm, I'm naming this sin. I'm trying to turn from this sin. I'm repenting and you know, asking God for His grace. And, and, and it seems that I struggle and I struggle and I struggle with this. How long will this last? My friend was so frustrated because the pastor chuckled and said, it's going to last all your life. That's a harsh reality, isn't it? That's a hard reality. But listen to me. Listen. And we're going to get to 1 John toward the end of this message. We as Christians still live in the realm of sin. We as Christians, though redeemed by Christ, if we're trusting in Christ, if we're believing in the merits of Christ on our behalf and have called on His name and He has saved us, we are still in the realm of sin. We're still in an atmosphere of sin, an environment of sin. Sin still has its presence all around us and our bodies are still corrupted by sin. Okay, so we await a couple of things. We have a hope that one day we will be delivered from the presence of sin. We have a hope that one day we will be delivered from temptation to sin. We have a hope that one day we will be delivered from a body that is corrupted by sin. That is the Christian hope. And all those things come fully in the presence of Jesus Christ when we receive a glorified body and when we, when we are in His presence for all eternity. So here on this earth, though, we still deal with and must deal with the problem of sin in our lives. This morning, I want to ask you, are you struggling to find joy in your life? Are you struggling with a lack of contentment in your life? Do you struggle with anger in your life? Do you struggle to bridle your own tongue? Do you struggle with thinking less of others? Thinking too highly of yourself? Do you struggle with humility? And by that I don't mean too much, but too little. I think we all have to, at least in our hearts, nod our hearts, right? We have to agree, don't we? Listen, the solution, there is an eternal solution, and that's what I just mentioned. Freedom from the presence of sin and of a full enjoyment of God and all His beauty and face to face with Christ for all eternity in a new glorified body. But here on this earth, I believe Paul is telling us that when we live a life where we are battling sin and we are looking at sin and pointing to sin and turning from sin, we can have increased joy. He said He has come to give us life and life more abundant. That John, when he talks about us having eternal life, he doesn't talk about a future life exclusively, but he talks about here and now, enjoying the new life that we have. We are a new creation in Christ. Because all things have been made new, Paul says in Galatians chapter 2. So this morning, I just want to ask you, as we look at this wrong conclusion that Paul is battling, are you dealing with the sin in your life? It takes work. Brothers and sisters, it takes work. Alright, so the what. First, we need to realize that we are dead to sin. He says in verse 2, by no means, how can we who died to sin still be, uh, excuse me, how can we who died to sin still live in it? So Paul hears giving us one of these very difficult uh, imperatives, one of these difficult commands. He's saying, stop living in it, is the implication, isn't it? Stop living in sin. <clears throat> As we continue in sin, if we continue in sin, we need to realize that we are living contrary to the new nature that we have. Paul elsewhere describes it as a life according to the flesh versus life in the spirit. In Romans chapter 8, he talks about that. So that's the what. That's part of the what. But look also, he says in verse 3, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Now we as Baptists, we think of a baptistry, don't we? Anytime we see the word baptized. Well, the word baptized comes from the Greek word baptizo. To baptize, right? Baptize, right? You can hear that. Baptizo, Baptist. And it simply means to bathe, dip, or immerse. Right? It's good bad to say it doesn't mean to sprinkle. Right? It means to bathe, dip, or immerse. So the word baptism, for us in practice, the ordinance of baptism looks like someone being immersed in water and raised from water. Right? Here the word baptism is also, it's, it's, it's alluding to something, it's referencing something that has happened for us. As believers in Christ, not only have we gone through a ritual or a rite or an ordinance that pictures our death, burial, and resurrection with Christ, but that is a picture of of our unity with Christ. And Paul is saying, if Jesus died, we died with Him. And if Jesus was raised to walk in the newness of life, or if Jesus' new life represents what we have in Christ, 
then when we continue in death, then we're saying that our baptism was a joke. It was a farce. It didn't mean anything. When indeed the opposite is true. We are united with Christ. And we have the privilege in our union with Christ of being new. And having a new life. To live a new life with new tastes. And new opinions. And new thoughts. And new works of grace. Therefore we look at one another through that union with Christ. And we have more patience. And more grace. And we have more joy. And more contentment. Right? So first is the what. Second, I want us to see the why. The why. Let's pick up with verse, the end of verse 3. And it says, Been baptized into Christ Jesus, baptized into His death. We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we, too, might walk in newness of life. And there's our purpose. There's the why. If the what is that we're united with Him, <coughs> the why is so that we might walk as a new creation. You see, God, and this, this kind of goes really big picture all of a sudden. You imagine a telephoto zoom lens where we focus in on one microscopic aspect of our Christian walk, and all of a sudden it goes real far back through telescope, and we look at God's purpose in creation. And they're linked here in this sense, that God created the world to demonstrate His glory. And He allowed things to happen like the fall of man into sin that He might set forth His Son, Jesus Christ. From eternity past, He made this decision. That we, who turn from our sin and embrace Christ and realize that Jesus was set forth for us, become participants and share in the glory of God by reflecting back to God the glory that He demonstrates by giving His Son for us. Big picture stuff here. But also in the microcosm, he's saying that we might walk in the newness of life, that we might image forth a new creation, that we might reflect who we are versus who we used to be. And I was joking with somebody, uh, was it Sunday school last week? I think it was. We were talking about James taming the tongue, right? And I told the guys in the class, I said, I used to have a nickname, and I couldn't think of it for a second, and then I remembered, and they, they called me Razor Tongue. Raise your tongue, Tommy. And I've still got some of that. Maybe just a little. I would say that I've gotten rid of it, but I have family here, so <laughs> they know the truth. Right? But I had a nickname, Raise your tongue. And I can remember in my younger years how quick I could be with a zinger. Some of them were good, some of them weren't. Let's just be honest. But I always laughed, right? But I'm a new person, aren't I? I'm a new person. And I told the guys in the class the other day, Look, if we're not growing beyond these childish things that we struggle with, you know, the, the nickname Razor Tongue, we might wink and laugh and joke and elbow. But have you ever been around somebody? I've been around folks, and, and, and I thought, you, you're 40, 50, 60 years old, and you act like you're still in high school. I don't mean that as a put down. What I mean is socially. Brothers and sisters, if we're not building one another up with our words, what are we doing? If we're taking the opportunity to bless one another with words of mercy or encouragement or even words of truth. But yet we're still a razor tongue like we were at 17 years old. We're not demonstrating the newness of life, are we? That's just one example for us. Right? We could substitute in for the tongue there perhaps worry in our hearts. What am I going to do in the hand wringing that so many do? And I'm learning with our kids as they grow up, there are certain things that I never knew I'd worry about <coughs> for my children. Right? But what do we do? We walk in the newness of life and we trust that God is in control of things and we do what He calls us to do and we entrust them to the Lord. Right? So that's some of the why. So let's continue reading there. He says that we might walk uh, in the newness of life. And then he goes on and he talks in verse 5, we've been united with Him. Uh, we shall certainly be united with Him. Again, verse 6, we know that our old self crucified with Him in order the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So that, anytime you see a so that, it's a purpose statement in the Bible. In other words, <coughs> this happens so that this next thing might happen. So that, in verse 6, we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Why are we to no longer 
walk as the old self? Why until we walk in the newness of life? Why does it matter that though God has justified us, we are not to continue in sin, thinking that I can do whatever I want, once saved, always saved. It doesn't matter what happens from now until eternity because I have called on the name of the Lord. He says, you have been saved. You have been united with Christ. And you are freed from sin. You are no longer enslaved to sin. You see, there are four categories. And I don't know if I can say this and, and, and communicate as well as if I could demonstrate it, but I didn't put it on the slide. Adam and Eve were born with the ability not to sin. They were born, born, born with what Calvin called a free will. They could choose not to sin, but Adam and Eve chose to sin. Okay, the next category of people are all the offspring from Adam and Eve. Everyone born since Adam and Eve is born in sin. Therefore, everyone born after Adam and Eve, all their offspring, is not able not to sin. Did you catch that? Not able not to sin. That is, until you reach the third category. Those of us who are redeemed by the grace of God are now able not to sin. We've been given a new will. Our bondage of our will to sin has been relieved. And we are now freed from the mastery, the dominion of sin. And we are now able not to sin. That's category three, right? So Adam and Eve born special, able not to sin. Everyone after them born not able not to sin. Third category, those of us who are redeemed are now able not to sin. Guess what category four it is? One day, we will not be able to sin. You think about that in the new heavens and the new earth. Freed from the presence of sin. Freed from a body corrupted by sin. In the presence of God, never doubting again. Never worrying again. Never angry again. Never letting our, our tongue loose in criticism of another. We're not able to sin. We're freed then, from the power and the presence of sin, now, as believers, we are freed from the dominion of sin. But it takes a work of God's grace in our hearts to realize that, to walk that out, doesn't it? So let's continue on. So we're freed to walk in grace. So Paul here is going beyond this doctrine of justification, which he talks about extensively in chapter 5, right? He's Using legal terms, he's saying you are justified by grace in Christ. And that justification basically works like this. God has declared you righteous, right, based on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So as Christians understanding our Bible and understanding the New Testament, we see that we are not justified before God by our own works. Right? What, what James talks about is that that's a life, a demonstration of our works. Right? That, 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 that justified life comes with works. We will work. And Paul here calls it walking in the newness of life. So Paul, in chapter 5 and 6, is saying we're justified. God looks at Tommy Duke and he says, as a believer in Christ, I see you now through an alien righteousness. I, like, I look at you and you have a coat of many colors. You have a coat of one color, really. And that's the blood of Jesus Christ. He looks at me through Christ because of my relationship to Christ. Do you see that? Now, for all those outside the covering of the righteousness of Christ, He looks at you and He says, you are not justified in my sight, but the other, rather you're guilty of your sin. So Paul takes that weighty theological discussion about justification and he says, this has very, very practical outworkings and don't come to the wrong conclusion. That once we're covered under the grace of Christ, we can now live any way that we choose. And grace just abounds. He says, no. We're dead to sin. We're united to Christ. And he says, we're to walk in newness of life. We're free to walk in grace. That's the what and the why. But then he also spends some time here on the how. The how of that relationship. Look at verses 5 and following. With We'll read down through about verse 14. He says, For if we have been united with Him, in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. 
For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, I don't want to miss that if. That's such a tiny word, isn't it? If we have died with Christ. Listen, this morning, if you, if you are unsure that you have been united to Christ in His death and in His resurrection, I want you to cling to this passage. I want you to cling to the hope that Jesus Christ is your only hope. And turning from your sin and embracing Christ is the only way that you too can participate in a new life. A little word there, if. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with Him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Wow, that's amazing. Verse 9. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over Him. For the death He died to sin once for all, but the life He lives, He lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves, must reckon yourselves dead to sin, and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So how then do we live a life under grace? First, there's a, a mental realization. There's a cognitive aspect to this. Is it? Did you see the word no? I tried to emphasize that as we were reading. The word no. So it says in verse 6, We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. There is... First, a realization that we are a new person. As I mentioned, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Behold, you're a new creation, right? We're a new person. We need to know that. Why is that important? Well, it's important that we know right things, isn't it? It's important that we set our mind on right things, isn't it? Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 is more than just a, a sort of a filter through which we understand what kind of entertainment that we look at or that, that we participate in, think on these things, whatever is pure and lovely and noble and all that. There's a new way to think, isn't it? To, the, the Apostle tells us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, doesn't he? There's a cognitive aspect to this. We're to take hold of, hold fast with our minds that we are a new creation in Christ. He says we know that we have this. But also we need to hold things in light of who we were. Remember from Ephesians chapter 2. He says that we too were sinners. We too were condemned. We too were under God's wrath, even as the rest. But God has made us alive in Jesus Christ. The cognitive aspect here, the what we know is that as believers we are a new creation and we are saved from a wretched life of sin. That's a cognitive aspect. That's the mental realization. But second, we also have the, the focus of a future hope. Look at verse 5 again. For if we've been united with Him in a, in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that He would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with Him. Believer, don't give up on the future. Hope sometimes in our darkest moments in life, all we have left to cling to is nothing in this world. Everything's in tattered and ruins and we can't see beyond the death and the destruction and the despair that's all around us. And so we fix our hope, like Peter says, on that which lies ahead, on that which God has in store for us. We look beyond our present circumstances and we trust that God's grace is good for us. And therefore, we walk by faith. And we walk in the newness of life, demonstrating that we're a new creation and that our justification, that our right standing with God has practical implications and outworkings. So, the mental realization, the focus on future hope, but also uh, verse 12 here says, Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from life, or excuse me, from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. There's a disciplined practice here. <coughs> I told y'all on another opportunity I had to preach that I like flashlights. In my job, everybody needs a flashlight. So we buy the brightest little flashlights.
flashlights we can find. And we take them into people's houses and we walk around and we shine it up in the dark corners. And we go into closets, crawl spaces, and attics. And we look for things, right? We look for things that don't belong. We look for things that people don't want in their homes. And with a bright light. It's amazing what you can find with a bright flashlight, even when the lights are on, but much more so when the lights are off. There are times we'll walk through someone's house, and they probably think, what is this creepy guy doing? He's walking through my house in the dark. And we've got a bright flashlight. We're shining it at baseboards. We're looking up in the cracks. and It's amazing what you see in even a nice and clean home. Cobwebs. See dust. And I know that's what the ladies hate when our guys go into their homes and shine a light and see dust, and we got all kind of apologies. But I was going to clean that, and I was getting to that. And... But oftentimes we go, and people have called us, and there's something wrong with their bed. There's something creepy crawling in their bed. Mm. We get really three categories of people that think they might have the dreaded bed bug. Right? Three categories. One is a group of people who are convinced they've got a problem, right? They call us in. They know they've got them. They got bites to prove it. There's evidence all over the bed. They can see the books. They can look up the mattress, and they see it's there, right? We go in, and those people are convinced. Nevertheless, we go in with a bright flashlight, and we shine it around, and we say, yes, you do have that problem, right? And we expose that problem to them. Right, there's another group, though, we go to, and they say they're not sure. And so we go, and we look. Sometimes we find them. We say, yeah, you weren't sure, but here they are. We take our bright light. It takes a little more investigation. Right? It takes a little more time to walk through with our bright light. Look a little deeper. You really got to know what you're looking for. Some of these little pests, they're not quite microscopic. They're very small. When they're first born, they're almost a white the leg. I know you guys are going to be itching and, and dreading this later. And I'll leave the business cards on the table. <laughs> Right, so that second group, they're not convinced, but you show it to them, you shine your bright light on it, and who can argue with that? You've exposed it, right? There's also a third group of people. It's a third group. Sometimes, maybe an elderly person, their child says, hey, I need you to come in and look, there's some problems, I'm starting to see some welts in somebody's arms or back or legs or whatever. Or maybe it's somebody who's got a really nice house, right? They've been paid for somebody to come in and clean it. Many, many square feet, all this, you know, very, very nice house, very clean. And they call us and they say, well, I don't think there's a problem, but somebody said that we need to look. So we go in there and we look and we shine our bright light. Sometimes we find a nice house, clean person, a lot of money. This bright light shines through the darkness and reveals that there are pests there that need to be killed, removed, eradicated, destroyed. You guys get where I'm going with this, right? Paul says here, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Let not the pests and the bed bugs remain on your body. Take the light. God's Word. The truth of God's Word. Right? The, the bright, holy fire of His presence. And let it shine into your closet. And into your bedroom. And into your car. And into your workplace. Right? And into your heart. And God's bright light shines into that darkness. And it shows us that there is indwelling, remaining sin that we must put to death. There's a disciplined practice. Practically speaking, that looks like taking that bright light, identifying that sin and the heart and the root of that sin and seeing it's pride in our own lives. It's a lack of trust, a lack of faith, a lack of belief that God is good and He holds out good things for us thinking that we can deal with something on our own or hold something back or hide that thing or deny that it's even there. 
Rather, daily we walk with Christ and we allow Him to shine the light of His Word in there. And then turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses just a couple pages over. Verses 1 and 2. Paul writes to the same church in Rome. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. It is a disciplined practice. But look down at verse 14. Back in chapter 6, verse 14. Listen to this. And I thought about how do we read this verse? What's Paul's tone? What's the timbre of his voice? What is Paul saying in verse 14 here? Read along as I'm reading aloud. It says, For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law but under grace. Paul says here, emphatically, believer, the life that you have, the new life in Christ, is not a law that is enslaved to sin, but rather you are freed by God's grace. He says, sin will have no dominion over you. What a shame, church, that we live lives denying that sin is a problem for us. We must, this morning, turn from that sin and acknowledge those dark cracks and crevices in our lives, perhaps large areas and chambers in our heart where we're allowing sin to dwell and to fester. It will kill you. It will. Listen. This is a strong word, but I believe this is the gist of what John is saying in 1 John. If you continue in sin, you have no hope that you know Christ at all. You say, I can't lose my salvation. Once saved, always saved. I'm telling you that Scripture is confronting you this morning, and if you are continuing in unrepentant sin, then you have no hope whatsoever that you know Christ unless you turn from that sin. Because that's the spirit that God has put in you. Flip over with me and we'll, we'll conclude with this. From 1 John chapter 1. Turn to your right about that many pages. First John chapter 1. Just look at these words as I read them aloud. 1 John chapter 1 verse 5. John writes these words. 1 John 1, 5 says, This is the message we heard from Him and proclaim to you, that God is light. And in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. In verse 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful <coughs> and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar. His word is not in us. Brothers and sisters, turn your gaze here as we conclude this morning. I want you today to see that there is joy and hope and life and freedom and a life <coughs> that is freed from the dominion of sin.